Hello, everybody. If you're here, join us and say hello. Can't wait to talk to you about capital campaigns today. Let's this be see. a great conversation, Gail. I uh, know. I don't see any chat message. Hello, Yana Ross says, good morning. Tell, tell everybody, introduce yourself in the chat box and share your organization and where you're located. And Catherine, we can ask all sorts of fun questions in the we chat. We can. We I, can. I, well, people are getting along in these er various areas. I know. How are, how, if you're having a campaign, share with us how your campaign is going. Like, or if you're up. planning <laughs> the visioning sex dis and discussing a campaign, let us know. So we see Leona Ross has said hello. And there, oh, there's Bonnie from Calvert Marine. How are you doing? I love my maritime museums. I've worked with so many of them over my career. And so here we are, Minnesota Project, Project Diva International. Welcome, Leona. And Stacy, Director of Development for the New Life Mission in Melbourne. How are you doing, Stacy? And here's Erin Payne from the Hill School. Our hey, Erin. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome. If you're just joining us, please uh, say hello in the chat box and introduce yourself. We love seeing our clients and our former yeah. clients and our hope for new clients and anybody that we can offer some assistance to today. The Greater, the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria, the parent, Northwest Arkansas, Given Tusk Foundation in Pine. Oh. Laura, thank so there's you. Libby from the Adrian Museum. I, I mean, excuse me, Adrian Symphony. So Libby, are, is that Adrian, Michigan? I've actually been to Adrian, Michigan. <laughs> with all. Years ago. Years ago. Yes, it is. <laughs> Everybody say hello in the chat box if you're just joining us and introduce your organization and where you're located so we can all say hello. And you can see who's on the um, webinar with your colleagues. Concordia University. How are you doing, Jennifer? Um, Blue Ridge Health. Hi, Catherine and Steve from um, the Homestead Museum and our friends in Charleston and our friends in Ontario. Isn't it fun to see the, um, the broad community that we have as nonprofit leaders? It, it's, um, it's heartening to me to see the diversity of our missions and all the different locations mm -hmm. around the world because we actually work, um, we do a lot of our training worldwide. Mm -hmm. It Christine really is. Pennsylvania. Welcome, welcome everybody. Jeff from Peoria mm -hmm. and Gidden, Gidden Homestead in Illinois. Jan, welcome, welcome. University of Rhode Island. Catherine and I both um, were born as fundraisers in our infancy. <laughs> in, um, I started at Duke University and then I went, went on to Chapel Hill. I did my first successful campaign at the age of five. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> on a wildlife gosh my father was so so involved oh, wonderful like forever great this is great it's great well, I, to see everyone thank you all for joining yeah i think we should get started what do you think Catherine? i think that'd be great uh, right screen open here we go how are we doing are we seeing our powerpoint yes everybody. all right hold on one sec i've just lost my chat box Oops. Catherine, you want to say hello I'll say hello to everyone. Let's see. I'm going back. Let's see. We've got a few more people in coming in. Um, this is great. Wonderful to have everyone. Um, thank you, Libby. That's fine. We'll be sending out the slides tomorrow, I believe. So this is great. Welcome, everyone. We're really excited to have this opportunity to talk to you about, um, you know, one, wildly successful capital campaigns, but more importantly, how to get ready for them. So, hey, Kim from Abel, good to see you. Glad you joined today. Um, so let's talk about our agenda because we have a lot to cover. As you can imagine, I can't mm -hmm. tell you the questions we've gotten from A to Z on helping to get ready. And some campaigns are stuck in the middle. And so we'll try to address those as well. But we're going to give you sort of an introduction to campaign readiness. And then we've got our checklist if you've been following our blog and our newsletter, we've had a series of articles, the so six different separate articles, standalone articles about the different areas that you need to prepare. And we're going to be reviewing um, these six areas today. So this is like the culmination of our, our, our article series. And we're going to get, we have a gift for you, a PDF of your capital campaign checklist. We're so pleased to um, share that with you to help you and your team 
uh, nail a wildly successful capital campaign. And we hope to have some discussion and questions because we had so many questions. Gosh, I think we had over 50 questions, y'all. And so, Catherine, I guess you can introduce me and I'll introduce you. Yes, that'll be great. Well, Gail Perry, um, first of all, it's been my privilege and, and pleasure to work with Gail for years, really, uh, not only here in this this area, but also previously, she was my consultant back in the day um, when I was at St. Mary's School. But as I think many of you know, she is a leader, a thought leader. She's an expert in this field, consultant and coach, many years of experience, led many, many, many campaigns. Um raised significant amounts of money for clients and across the country and in some ways, even the world. She's been a speaker across the globe. Um, and she's also one of the top 10 uh, in America fundraising es- experts. And it is my great privilege to work with her. Well, it's my great privilege to work with my partner in crime, Kath- Dr. Catherine Gamble. We have to remember the PhD. Uh, and by the way, her PhD was on board governance and board power, which probably would be a, an area of great interest to many of us. Mm-hmm. But Catherine is, is is a major gifts expert, capital campaign expert. She runs our consulting program. And right now she is managing, I, 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 I think it's almost a billion in capital campaigns that we are, we are um, um, consulting and coaching around the world and the country. Uh, and she's also an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins teaching nonprofit governance and leadership. So we are we are well equipped to share um, after all of our years of experience. We stopped counting our years of experience. Uh, and just a little quick note about our company. We um, our company mission is to provide resources, strategies, coaching and inspiration to nonprofit leaders around the world so that you can change the world. Uh, We are absolutely clear about our mission. Uh, Our clients come first. Our commitment to the nonprofit sector and to making the world a better place always comes first. We are a female-led company, and we think we have a female ethos that is beneficial to our clients uh, and to our training. And we are not, um, if I may say, we're not beholden to outside investors or an artificial profit line. We are in business to help our clients create extraordinary fundraising results. Catherine, do you have anything to say about our company? Well, it, first of all, it is a fabulous place to work. So I'll say that <laughs> because it is, and it's true. Every day, every day, something wonderful happens for our clients. As Gail was saying, that is the thing that inspires us every day. So whether we're, our client is, a, is, is a, in education or in healthcare uh, or social services or the environment, wh- whatever sector, um, our clients are working in, we are right there with them. Nothing is more important to us than our clients' missions. And and to see them expand their missions in the world vis-a-vis the campaign is something that we live for. Uh, yeah, so it's our pri- yeah, so it's our privilege to be with you all today. And I hope we're able to share many things that you want to to learn today. Thank you. And also I do want to put in a plug. We we have a, a coaching, a major gifts intensive we run every year for four months first part of the year. And if you're, if you want to prepare for a campaign and if you want to prepare your donors for a campaign, consider, check out the major gifts intensive. We haven't opened it up yet, but uh, all of our clients send their staffs through this detailed training on all aspects of major gift fundraising. So just be on the lookout if you're interested in that, but let's talk about getting ready for a capital campaign, Catherine. Mm-hmm. We have to ask you, why is it so important? Oh, to- Wow. Oh, sorry, go ahead. (laughs) I'm ready to answer the question. (laughs) Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. (laughs) No, I was just going to leap in. This is what, see, we're so excited about things. We just leap in together on these things. But it's really about when you want to get, when you're getting prepared, I said it yesterday to a potential client, and that is you're sitting at the end of the runway and you need to get down the runway and that plane called your campaign needs to get into the air vis-a-vis building confidence and momentum, two key ingredients, and being prepared, being ready, moving forward, spending that time, investing that time, and getting ready for your campaign will make all the difference to the end result. It will help you get soar past your goal. And one of the challenges we have is that lots of times boards and sometimes executive leaders are pushing, pushing, pushing. When are we going to start? When are we going to start? When are we going to start asking for money, please? 
And so we would like to say carefully that you need to do all the, all the strategy work happens before you start asking. All the strategy, recruiting the right people, lining up your lead gifts, getting all getting the hot buttons and the case all ready to go. Um, and if you are rushing to get started because you have external pressure outside of the Advancement Development Office, you're going to be in serious trouble. And we we get we get wailing and sad emails. Oh my gosh, our campaign is stalled in the middle of the campaign. We've raised half the money and we've run out of prospects. What happens then, Catherine? Why did that happen? Why did that happen? Well, it happened because the things that we're going to talk about with you today didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And as Gail was talking about, probably the asking and soliciting donors started too quickly. Uh, and that meant that means that you're probably most likely not getting the uh, largest gift from that particular donor. Mm -hmm. And you're not, you haven't identified the right people to be on the right seats for your campaign. We, what happened, here's a question to ask your leadership who may be pushing is what happens if we ask too early? And everybody knows this. Your board members will say back, ooh, if you ask too early, you get a no or you get a much smaller gift. Mm -hmm. And so I, I mentioned Duke University earlier. One thing I learned at Duke way back was that the number of times you are in front of a donor before the ask, the bigger the gift. So there's a great role, rule of thumb to remember that there's a ratio between the size of the gift and the amount of um, cultivation, nurturing time that you have. So Catherine, let's go ahead and dive in into yes. our six steps, okay? Okay. So I wrote a whole book about board members and fundraising once upon a time, and I still, I still work with boards. I'm working with a client board tomorrow. Um, is your board ready for a campaign? And so we have to get our boards ready. Why, Catherine? What happens? Why do we have to? Oh. Well, a couple of reasons. One is they need to be 100% behind the strategy and the plan for the campaign. That is key. They absolutely have to have confidence um, in what it is that you're going to do. And so another thing is they need to be aligned to that. We're talking about alignment here. I really think that's what we're talking about. We have several steps that we take with boards in that process of planning for the campaign that helps them align. I like to say fly like geese, mm -hmm. Gail, and it'll be part I, of what I, it is you're doing. When I was early, I'm sorry, I'm just dying to share this. But I, I, when I was just starting out as a consultant, I wasn't as experienced as I am now. And I had I had one wonderful organization turned out to be a hugely successful. It was a it was a botanical garden, um, and it turned out that the board was not a hundred percent in favor of a big campaign. They were scared. They were nervous. They were unsure. This was like a big big leap, heavy lift, and um, a lot of the women, older women who had founded this garden, were, were not. Um, familiar with big ticket fundraising, high dollar fundraising. Of course, they were all million dollar prospects, but they, you know, we weren't talking about that. And so we we had to do some serious work with this board to keep to create agreement, because what was happening was is that there were little conversations in the bathroom in the parking lot after my meetings with them, and they were muttering about whether this was a good idea or not, or the fact that they did not agree with the campaign strategy because they were, I think, nervous. They didn't understand it. What do you think, Catherine? One hundred percent. I think, and sometimes their nervousness, as Gail's talking about, is based on their past experiences. So we have a client. I'll tell this really quickly. Um, who a number of years ago uh, ran a six million dollar campaign that took them about five years and exhausted everybody, especially the board. And when we came on and did the feasibility study for their current thirty six million dollar campaign. Um, the board was very concerned about um, how, you know, what what would their lists were going to look like and what they were going to do and how could they do this. And they just weren't they just were very, very concerned and nervous, like Gail's talking about, because their previous experience was exhausting, just barely successful and took forever uh, to get it done and just took a whole lot of work. I was with them last week and the board members, this is what you want to hear, the board chair, the former board chair, who was also the campaign of that, I mean, the chair of that previous campaign, were sitting here saying that 
this is the best campaign. Everything you've taught us is working. <laughs> they've raised over nine. They, in fact, they just emailed me. They hit 10 million now uh, just since last week uh, and, and in, in just over a year, just over a year because they lined up and they did all their preparation like we're talking about today. Well, so you getting getting those dominoes lined up before the campaign is really and getting your board members aligned. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have your board members become your greatest fans because you are achieving so much success? Um, let's move on to I see we have a couple of um, organizations who completed our major gifts intensive wow. last year. Thank you so much, Susan and Jesse May. Um, we have so much fun in that program. Um but we want board members who are influential. And, you know, if you're thinking about a capital campaign in the future years, you might want to add board members who have connections to wealth and or deep pockets yourself. You don't need a whole you don't need a whole um, board full of these types of people because you want diversity of all voices and you want your board to also reflect your community of stakeholders. However, you also want the connections to wealth and some deep money because the best possible situation is a dedicated, passionate board leader really steps up to either offer the, um, the lead gift or one of the lead gifts or chair the campaign. Mm -hmm. So we, we like to be, make sure that board members have those two qualities. And also, uh, let's speak a little bit about the whole concept of confidentiality. Because mm. I have found way too often that board members don't understand that these prospect lists, I mean, often we don't share a detailed prospect list with the full board at all, just a small group who's involved with the campaign, uh, again, because they just don't have any background in this kind of fundraising. Right, Catherine? Right. I mean, they really do. And you have to really um, share with them and, and talk to them about confidentiality and what it what it means. And like Gail says, there is no reason to share a long list of potential donors with your board, frankly, ever. <laughs> um, <laughs> not just in the campaign environment, but it's all it does really is kind of create, not only do, does is confidentiality an issue in that doing that, but it also sort of unnerves the board. Um, so I wouldn't do that at all, but do discuss com confidentiality with them. And I want to say one additional thing about the, the influential piece, Gail, what you were talking about, putting, adding donors, your board recruitment should always be focused on what your organization's current strategies are. So you're looking for the right people who fit your organizational strategy. So if you're organization is hitting into a campaign because you're building a building, creating a new program, whatever it is, the purpose of your campaign. That campaign is also a strategy, meaning that you need board members also aligned to that strategy. So are they influential? Can they make larger gifts? Um, and can they in some way support the strategy of a uh, more deeply because of greater understanding or experience, um, it be more influential in helping support your campaign strategy. That's and, right. And, and, you know, uh, board members often are worried about their, their, the expectations for them to give. And again, as I just said, you want so much, you want diversity, robust diversity on your board. And so it's very important for your board members to understand that everybody should make a gift that they're personally proud of and they're personally capable of. of. Um, the, board, your board members do not, they all, all should give 100% to the campaign. They've got to put their money where their mouth is since they're the organization's legal leaders and owners. However, uh, it's a very important for you to understand. Oh, Catherine, I just use your favorite phrase. Very important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have several favorite phrases. Like, <laughs> uh, but, they're, but, they're, but, they're, but they're going to be asking about their financial expectations upon them personally. So board members are going to bring their own personal uh, maybe fears and expectations and their personal experiences to the boardroom when it comes time to discuss a capital campaign. So again, it's so important to make sure that you, you stage discussions so that every voice is heard. And that's when you can use an expert facilitator or learn some good facilitation skills yourself. Because, you know, they're going to ask about their own um, financial contribution expectations. They're going to want to know, do they need to be raising money? Our board member yesterday in our presentation, he, he, he sort of made some comments about he wasn't so sure that he knew how to ask for money. And so what do we say about that, Catherine? 
Oh, we take that off the table for the board. There is no, so the key phrase that we use um, in this case is, and this is true for any volunteer, including campaign leadership, we only ask a volunteer, board or, or campaign leader, uh, to make the calls only they can make. So what does that mean? That means we're not prescriptive in which you see many times in job descriptions for both the board and the campaign leadership uh, often talk about you'll make 10 calls or you'll introduce us to five people. It sounds like a souped up development officer job <laughs> for a volunteer. <laughs> we rewrote that, um, what we do, uh, what we encourage uh, for our organizations to uh, describe the role of both their board and their campaign leadership. And it has nothing to do with asking for money unless they are the only one who could do it. Right. And so I think it's very important for you to take the idea of asking for money and making campaign solicitations off your board's plate, mm -hmm. because that is so last century in terms of distributing cards and everybody has their list and they go after that is not the way to raise the biggest money at all. Instead, you want to follow the donor pyramid approach and very strategic and use the role of influencers to really make sure you get the largest gift possible. Um, and one more topic about boards that I think is something that a lot of people forget is so helpful to have board members who understand capital campaigns and how it's done because the, the traditional, uh, no, the successful strategy for a capital campaign is not intuitive. And therefore um, it, it, it backs you up to either have strong consultants always and also board leaders and board members who can can help sway the opinion of the other board members so that they understand that this strategy is the one the strategy that's going to bring them the most success. So I tell you what I haven't seen any comments in the chat box in about 10 minutes. <laughs> so let me just ask y'all how are you doing with your board getting your board ready for the campaign? Let's see, let's hear from some people in the chat box and we're going to go on and we're going to talk about your volunteer leaders. Mm -hmm. Volunteer leaders. Oh, oh, not that great. Not that great. Somebody is <laughs> you know, it's 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 important to have these discussions and get everybody aligned. Uh, alignment is just so so important. Um, I will say one thing about a campaign I had once that um, the board members were divided about whether to have the campaign or not, and there was a lot of dissension in the background. And we staged, um, we staged a community visioning day and we had all the important leaders in the entire community in one big circle. And we spent the morning going around the circle asking everybody what their vision was of this successful campaign once it was completed. And by that time, the board members were so, they saw the kind of support from the community for this project that they all signed up 100% in support. Um, so Jessie May said that she's been educating her board members about all this. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. And um, Catherine's is, is a bit challenged. Yeah. And um, it, yeah, some board members will self-select off the board because they're personally discomfort, um, uncomfortable about fundraising, but they don't have to do the fundraising. That's the problem. They, they don't have to do You don't want your board members out there asking for money willy nilly. Sometimes what happens is um, you have something called an ambush ask because board members don't understand the detailed preparation of warming mm -hmm. up a donor and making sure that every all the stars are aligned and the donor is ready to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's talk about volunteer leaders. This is one of our also the you, you're going to have to have this critical ingredient if you want to have a successful campaign. And so the kind of volunteer leaders you want sort of helping to brand your campaign in the community are people who have credibility and who are known because by lending their name to your effort, they are um, blessing your initiative. And it builds confidence in donors that these people who are leaders in your stakeholder community are behind the campaign. And look, you may be a huge or a university or a grassroots organization, you have stakeholders, you have leaders, um, volunteer leaders who are well known and well respected in both of your communities. So you don't have to, you don't have to reach for the stars if you're a grassroots organization. Instead, get people who are known and trusted. Right, Catherine? Isn't right, that absolutely. We frame it three ways. We talk about three, three words we use to frame um, volunteer leadership. It's inspire, 
influence, invest. That's it. That's their job. That's their role. And so to Gail's point that she's making about leaders that are in your, you know, influ- I mean, that inspire confidence in your community, that's the inspiration part, that they're passionate and committed. Uh, they are they are credible. They are authentic, these kinds of things. And so they're inspirational because when people will note them on your leadership, that's lending, they're lending their kind of credibility to your organization and your campaign. It's part of that confidence piece that I talked about at the beginning and part of that momentum piece that's going to get your campaign really uh, rolling down the runway and up in the air. Like it's my favorite thing, (laughs) the airplane. (laughs) This is a great question from Lenore Leeds. Um, Your volunteer leaders is your campaign steering committee and your campaign chairs. Your board is your board. <clears throat> Almost always, we want a separate committee who are um, recruited and enlisted, enlisted to be active in fundraising effort. Um, but also, I want to go back to what Catherine said. She said that we want our leaders to influence, invest. And what was the third one, Catherine? Inspire. Inspire. Mm-hmm. So um, it's, it, we, we always say to the, the most influential people we can possibly get hold of to, it, to, to be willing to lend their name to our campaign is either a chair or an honorary chair. We say to them, only make the calls that you can make, just you. And Catherine mentioned that before, but I really want to drive that point mm-hmm. home. That's the way to get the big, big cheeses to say yes. Mm-hmm. Because they know they go, oh, okay, yeah, I, I know exactly who I can ask and how I should ask and why I should ask and what the hot buttons were. And mm-hmm. they start thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I saw somebody do that last week when I said, this is your job. Just the calls that only you can make. And she was she was like this, hmm, gosh, hmm. So she was excited about that. And that's what we want with um, our volunteer leaders. Um and also remember, as you're recruiting your campaign steering committee, they need to be able to make major gifts to the campaign. You know, they need to believe in your mission. They need to be able to recruit others and enlist others to come join the initiative and the momentum that you're building. And what about this last bullet on this page, Catherine? Absolutely. Give your team feedback and guidance on the case. We've got several of these, um, that kind of activity going on right now with several of our campaigns where we're, whether we're in, we're going to talk about the early case at some point, but today, but where, whether we're talking about the early case or, or the more um, later in the campaign, the more, more completed case, if you will, um, they are, their voice is really important. And, an, and another way we sometimes frame the role of the volunteers, of volunteer leaders, campaign committee, planning committee, whichever stage the campaign's in, um, that we talk about is that, the, and why this is important, is that their voice, their voice represents the voice of your donors, Okay, so they that's their that's part of their real role. And that's why everybody gets so hung up on asking in campaigns. But honestly, while clearly, obviously, it's important at some point, but really, this is what this is about. Their role, part of their role is being that voice of the donors that you're reaching out to. So their feedback and their guidance on the case is really important. And, you know, we we as consultants, one of our jobs is our number one job is strategy. And we help sort of circle the wagons around key donors. I remember there was a, a project we were working on in, in the north, in the eastern part of North Carolina, where we're located. And it was a foster home organization. And there was a, a foundation, a very large uh, family health foundation that was well known in that same area. Well, we, we managed through our, the, the, or, the connections of the organization. I think it was actually through a church connection to enlist um, a former governor of North Carolina to make a call that only he could make to the foundation leaders. He said, oh, well, I know this organization. Yeah, I'll make that call because, you know, that's what former governors do. They <laughs> like to, they like, they're seen as community fathers yeah. and mothers and they want to help the community. And so he picks up, oh, well, you know, these are good people and I think you should be generous to them. You know, blah, blah. What are you thinking? You know, so it's the kind of good old boy, good old boy conversations, good old girl conversations do happen and, and I will also remind you that when you're dealing with a lot of these influential volunteers, um, a lot of fundraising happens, little tiny bits of fundraising, key steps happen in social situations. And so 
for all often in your community, um, the people who are influential and the people who are top donors do know each other. And they may belong to the same clubs or do the same sports or run to the same business meetings. And so there's an opportunity just to sort of drop a little idea here and there. And that's that's why we like people who are well networked and active in the community, right, Catherine? Absolutely. I mean, it really is so important. And you know, we had that campaign where, where I was mentioning a minute ago that's now just crossed the $10 million mark. Um, they they have been doing uh, tours, which are really important, and their volunteer leaders also participate in those tours and invite people to come to the tours. They love the tours. They say it makes all this so easy. Mm-hmm. And also, y'all, our tour that we teach our clients is called the storytelling tour, and it's very different from what you might expect a tour is. And it, and I will say of this particular client, um, one of their foundation um, uh, funders came through on this. I'm very proud of this, Catherine. Uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, it came through on this show and tell storytelling tour and the foundation executive said to our client, for 20 years of site visits, I have never had such an excellent experience. So mm-hmm. hooray, hooray. Yay. Yeah. And then we'll we'll set the other thing they've been doing, and we have other others who want to this quickly is the porch party, which is a whole nother thing. We probably have, should have a whole nother webinar, Gail, just on those two strategies. <laughs> well, if y'all were following me last, uh, following us last summer, we were doing porch party videos, and we were we decided the world need light, needed lightening up, and so we were featuring porch parties and small donor cultivation events as a way to engage uh, your community and your key leaders. And Heather said, to, oh, she loved, it. by the Thank way, you you have find, we have a YouTube channel. You can, I think you can find them. On, and we even have a porch party resource center on our website. So <laughs> if you go to the search box, you can find that. And also you can pull out our material on tours. Um, we don't, we don't have a, we haven't really done a presentation on a storytelling tour in some time, but it's a very powerful um, experience to cultivate and engage your lead and your mid, mid-level donor prospects. Um, and so, Catherine, let this is her favorite topic, y'all, is the donor pipeline, the donor pool. And Absolutely. So, oh, somebody has just posted the porch party resource. And did. Uh, Thank you, Ann. <laughs> so, Catherine, tell us about the donors. What do we need to for oh. a really successful capital campaign? Well, the, the key is and this is the beginning. Yeah, we, this is probably the most important ingredient, and that is your donor pool. I mean, really, it truly is. You can have a lot of the other trappings of a campaign, but if you don't have an identified and ready-to-go pool of donors to support your campaign, it's going to be a little a bit, a bit of a heavy lift. Um, so this is really where, when we are working on helping our organizations, our clients, um, prepare for their campaigns, we really focus here. So this piece about a leadership gift for the campaign, have you identified this leadership gift? And so a leadership gift is usually these days, it it can vary a little bit. So none of this, you got to be a little flexible in your thinking and mindset to manage and deal with the campaign strategy. But usually it's around 20% of the campaign. That's sort of the, the number we start with. And then massage it based on what what the what the um, potential within that leadership potential leadership group of the campaign what that looks like. So we really focus in on those top twenty, top thirty, identif- identifying those people. And then we look at also what is the status of those relationships? Is it really really these these people are like in our back pocket? They're our best friends. They want to know what they are ready to go. That kind of thing. Or is the relationship a little cooler or a little further out? We've got a little work to do. And what does that work need to look like? And keep in mind, those of you who've been through our program, major gift program, you know this. Every strategy for each donor is unique to that donor. Everyone. So this is not about mailing letters or doing any of that kind of work. This is about strategizing and thinking through what are each step we're going to take with each one of these donors till we get to the point where we're having and ready to have a gift conversation. Mm-hmm. So that's really key in this. We've got to identify those top 20, top 30 prospects for your campaign. That number can be a little smaller, a little bigger, depending on the size of your campaign. But that's where we really want to focus first in the campaign process. And, you know, there are two different strategies that start from opposite ends. One is, can you make a list of your top 10 potential gifts or hoped for gifts on the back of a napkin or an envelope? 
hopefully you should be thinking about these individuals and sources. These can be corporations. They can be um, major foundations, small private foundations, donor advised funds, whatever, or, or your local government um, officials. Because we got, remember, public-private partnerships are one of our specialties in our company. We have even uh, um, registered as a lobbyist in the state, one state, to, to, um, to, to secure $5 million for a campaign. It worked. Um, <laughs> But um, but you 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 can always it's always nice to see who comes to the top of mind because that's that's information for you that these names are well known. And then the other direction is wealth screening, deep data mining. And now we can use AI and major gifts. We um, we are still exploring all of these new um, strategies and assets. But the fact is, we always look with very Catherine's middle name, by the way, is data. <laughs> And so she's she's pouring over the wealth screening reports. We are partners with Donor Search, and we we really recommend that them because um, we thought we think they're the best, and also because we 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 know how to we we have secret queries that yes. Catherine does that she can pull out to identify mm-hmm. sleeper major give prospects right at the beginning of a campaign. We 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 found one. We have a, a lot of Habitat for Humanity. Um, mm-hmm. Pro- campaigns and we we told our uh, development director these people are sleepers mm-hmm. and they're giving to you regularly for a very long time and and so what what happened what did Angie do Catherine she called this person and said well actually it was um of what she shared some of these names with with their her committee this again speaks to influence and someone on the committee knew this one person and called and said we'd love to come see you and they went to see them this gentleman, and he said, you know, it's time for us to step up and give. And he made a $125,000 commitment to their campaign. Their largest gift prior to that was $75. But we knew that they had the passion and the commitment to Habitat, and we knew they had the wealth. Mm -hmm. So Angie just said, would this be a good time to discuss your support of the campaign? (laughs) Favorite question. (laughs) I said, yes. Yes. Uh, By the way, Amory says, do you break down um, individual gifts from corporate and foundation gifts when you're doing your top 20? I would say no. I, I, we recommend t- looking every, um, every donor pool is going to be different for mm-hmm. every organization, um, every institution, every campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, so your opportunities, your opportunities, whether they are public sources, private sources, foundations, or corporations. And I, I think you're, you're better served at the very highest level to, and when you're trying to project your donor pipeline for the campaign, include them all. Now, when it comes time for strategies and execution, maybe that's the time when you break them into separate initiatives. Would you agree, Catherine? One hundred percent. And and um, I really do want to un- underscore, as Gail was talking about that campaign previously with the example of the sleeper donor, that particular organization was pretty much almost 100 percent individual support. But we have another, and this is also a Habitat affiliate client um, who just closed uh, one of their first lead gifts, $5 million, from a corporation. So they, that organization will have far more gifts from corporations and foundations, and then some are in a mix. But yes, 100% what Gail said, and when you're looking at your top 20, top 30 um, prospects, look at all of those prospects, corporations, foundations, even government, for yeah. sure, 100%. You know, if you're a larger institution, we're running a $350 million campaign in the Midwest for a children's hospital, and um, we're, we're, their donor pool looks very different. But the steps to close the gifts are the same. We have the influencers who are making only the calls they can make. We are preparing these donors who are also include some major corporate individuals. Um, we're preparing them and warming them up and warming them up and warming them up so that they're going to be ready when asked. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, you know, if you're a larger organization, you have principal gifts as well as major gift program. Um, you are evaluating your effectiveness of, um, and you're evaluating your donor potential. Um, and I agree with Catherine. I think donor potential is the number one ingredient for a successful campaign. And that's one of the first questions we ask when we're sizing up a potential client Do you think you can raise the money? (laughs) I'll say it this. Yeah. And I'll say it this way. I think this is really, I like to say this this way because, you know, campaigns are a strategy too. So is a major gift program. A major gift program does not need a campaign, but a campaign must have major gifts. Yeah. 
So if you, and I will say this, if you don't have a major gift program, let me be clear too, it doesn't mean you can't have a campaign. It means that you can actually use the campaign to build your major gift program. And then when you finish your campaign, you have this wonderful group of major donors who have not made their last major gift to you, I can assure you. You can roll right from, this is what universities do. Those of you who are with universities know this. Universities roll from one campaign to the next most of the time, and they just keep recycling and going back through and and seeing new ways to inspire their donors and to ask for those additional major gifts. Just keep on going. Mm -hmm. So you can do the same thing. Just keep in mind, you use that campaign as a a big investment of time and effort and, and investment in money to get a campaign going. And, and successful, you leverage that investment, leverage that investment into building yourself a really successful major gift program. And even in some cases, a planned gift program can also be part of this. That's right. And so everybody, how are you doing with your donor pipelines for your campaigns? Um, does everybody feel like you are preparing, you're, you're, you're identifying and you're researching and you're sizing up your major donor prospect list? Are you adding uh, numbers, uh, hoped for numbers um, for gifts and probabilities. We have, um, you want to talk a little bit about campaign by the numbers, Catherine? Yes. Yeah, so we're very, very much, I mean, campaigns are very predictable activities. And so when the prospect pool is well identified, which we're talking about in our, this is the first step in our campaign by the numbers, we also begin to evaluate the potential gift levels or gift ranges. I like to use a range because I call it a margin of error. Um, we build the ranges into this and we begin to put also estimate timing by quarters and we begin to kind of map out the donor pool based on that information. And every time our gift officers or our, or the people executing our campaign are out talking, uh, to their donors, learning something more, gaining information about timing. You can really ask a donor straight out what their timing is. They will tell you. Um, you can move that and you can begin to project your benchmarks for your campaign at what point you will be at what point in time. That's why you see the success that this client we've mentioned in Tennessee that is now just crossed the $10 million mark. That's why they're having this level of success. And they go back every quarter, minimally every quarter, sometimes more frequently, and they recalibrate the, the donor pool based on what they've learned and what is happening with them. So we always know, do we need to be sizing this up differently? Do we have enough prospects in the pipeline to complete the campaign successfully on time? What do we need to do to, if we need to identify additional donors, what, what levels do we need to identify? So gets into the kind of sciencey side of this. But again, it calms the waters. We have specific sets of reports that allow you to share this information uh, with your board, with your committee members. And when everybody knows that we have a plan and they know you're going forward um, with the right numbers and the right people, then the, the waters are calm. The, the, your leadership feels very confident in what is going to happen with the campaign. And again, that confidence um, and, and along with the momentum is what gets you successfully across the finish line. Yeah, our campaign by the numbers report keeps everybody happy and quiet. Mm-hmm. And yeah. don't interfere. Right. Quiet is <laughs> a <okay. laughs> like <that> <laughs> whole strategy around quiet. <laughs> got, I've got a really important question from Jr. here, um, Jesse May. Um, mm-hmm. If you if you have a major donor who's already made a gift, and you and you're can you ask them for another gift for this campaign? The yes. answer is yes, but you yes. have to do it carefully. And often, often we go back to our true believers to finish the last 10% of the campaign if, if we've exhausted our prospects or if we re- or the campaign capital project has increased, which capital um, projects, building projects can always increase. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's almost standard to go back to the early, early donors and ask them. I mean, you have to use permission. You know, we teach a conversation based ask approach with a lot of permission. And so if, if you're you can ask after them, they'd be willing to have another conversation about helping to complete the campaign and they can say yes or no. Um, and then, and so you know where you are, but Catherine, we've got, let's see, we've got a few more. We've covered our six mm-hmm. and made our first three. And now let's talk yeah. about um, these next four are not, are not as extensive, No, um, but you do need 
an early case for support. You do not need the four color brochure and the website while you are preparing your campaign. And we, we get so many requests, the board members, they all want to see the four color brochure. And, and, and they think that we're not having a campaign until we have all these materials. <laughs> Frankly, you can, we have raised millions of dollars without the materials. But the problem is, is that the campaign leaders or the board members don't understand how it's done. Mm -hmm. Right, Catherine? Right. And, and that goes back to something we said earlier when we were talking a little bit about the pipeline and the donors. Keep in mind, everything, you know, all your strategy around a particular donor is unique to that donor. So should be any paper that you give them describing what it is that you're doing. So this early case gives you that opportunity to, to allow that flexibility Let's say you have your your campaign has several parts or several things you're funding, and let's say you you know this donor really values deeply this one aspect of what it is you're raising money for. Do you want to send them a case for support that equally talks about all three things, or do you want to send them something more customized that amplifies the thing that they value the most, the thing that they potentially, if you do it the right way, that they may even be able to like make you know, very large gift, a lead level gift for that area of your campaign. So um, that customization is really critical. We kind of, we talk about that a lot with our clients. Mm -hmm. And we, we like to, um, we like to have a white paper or a vision statement, just maybe two pages when we're doing a feasibility study or we're having early conversations with donors, you do not need a lot of materials. And so the white paper format helps people think about this is our project. Lots of times we assign our clients to do the first draft of this thing, and they spend uh, three quarters talking about their organization and its history and its accolades and how great they are and how many people they serve, and then just like one little tiny paragraph about the project. Mm -hmm. so it needs to be turned around. You need to be talking about your project, how you're going to serve your community, how, what is this need, and how and why you're the best people to address it. And then you add... Uh, bells and whistles about your campaign. So people always are very confused about what goes on to a, into a campaign statement. It's a campaign case statement, but particularly the early case does not need to be fancy. Nope. Right. So right. let's talk, ooh, let's talk about the internal mm -hmm. development office because I, I also say that having a Cracker Jack staff um, that's fully staffed and they understand campaigns can make or break your campaign. It's your internal staff. And I would mm -hmm. also say smart consultants can make or break your campaign, but I really would probably need to say that your staff may be more important <laughs> than we are. Um, I remember one time I was working on a, um, I was, I was consulting um, a small, a small, a small Bible college in the South. And we managed to recruit this, this small young woman who was just a pistol. She was a fire breather. And, and, she, and she was off. Um, her family was from this area, so she knew a lot of the leading families. And um, I've never seen anybody drive a campaign internally more strongly than this young, young woman so who was fearless. So I would, I would encourage y'all, you're going to have to be fearless when speaking up to your campaign leaders and to your organizational mm -hmm. leadership. We also like to see a fully staffed office. Um, so um, I wrote um, I wrote in our um, newsletter, our blog last week, I don't know if you read it, I can't tell you how many organizational CEOs and board members want to come to us. They want to raise tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, but they don't want to hire new staff. <laughs> We see it all the time. I, we, oh. uh, my, my, we see it all the time. And, and I will say, and both Gail and I will say, and any of our consultants would say this to the organization. This is another beauty of, the, of a consultant. And consultant can say these things. Very, very. <laughs> We're your political <laughs> cover. <laughs> right. My teacher voice comes out on this stuff. But, um, and that is that, you, it, you know, it's very difficult to, um, ex, you know, you've got a certain output you're doing in your in your program now with the number of staff that you have, and suddenly the organization wants to do multiple times, 5, 10, 15, 20 times more output that a campaign requires with the same number of staff. That's like the definition of insanity. <laughs> Seriously, we've written that maybe a little nicer, but we've written that into our um into like if we do an, a readiness assessment for an organization, we will make that point. 
And those clients that, you know, can find the money, add to their team, especially investment in major gift officer, somebody who has some experience in this area, also on their team. That's true of our of our uh, organization in Tennessee that's so successful with the $10 million. They did add to their team. Very successful team, I will add. Mm-hmm. Very successful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the campaign budget is something that people don't understand either. Typically, the rule of thumb is, and this is a rule of thumb, you can share this with everyone, um, that the costs of a campaign usually are between 5 and 10% of the campaign goal. And you add those costs into the campaign goal. So instead of raising $10 million, you raise $11 million. Or instead of $100 million, you raise $110 because the money is not going to walk in the door. Somebody has got got to go out there and identify the donors and engage with the donors and entertain and socialize and tour and porch party and all the things you do of this vast donor pool to bring them closer to your organization. And then so you can have the one-on-one conversation, would you like to discuss supporting our campaign? So this stuff doesn't happen. It's not wish, it's not hope. Hope is not a strategy. It is a um, an absolute um, must have is that you've got to have. And you can also do a campaign, of course, without consultants. If you are considering doing your own feasibility study versus a, a, a consultant, we will be honest with you about the pros and cons of both. Just set up a strategy call. We offer um, strategy calls, free strategy calls, half an hour for anyone. We're happy to talk to you privately about your own, own issues in preparing for your campaign. And people are saying that they're very, very short staff. I will agree that major gift officers and people who experience the major gifts are harder and harder to find. Um, there's a buyer, no, there's a seller's market here in fundraising. But I would also suggest that we are seeing a lot of, um, we're, we've seen some disaffected major gift officers, particularly women who have small children who don't want to work full time for a while. They want to work part time for a while. And they're sort of like a hidden jewel if you can find the right the right fit for your organization. Um, what should the staff be? The staff really includes Anne-Marie on how big your campaign is. Do you have government um, prospects? Do you have foundation corporate? You know, is your major prospect list 300 people or more? Or is it just 20? So the amount of staff is, is relative to the complexity of your campaign. Um, and we, we could do a whole webinar on your feasibility study. Why? You, I mean, one of the reasons that we, we, we recommend feasibility studies a lot or all the time because we can't give you a campaign strategy without talking to your donors. Right. You can have your own, you can ha- do your own um, series of donor conversation, create your own campaign strategy. But if you want professional help, of experience who have had, you know, over three decades each um, of experience with capital campaigns, I'll tell you something, if you use experienced consultants, we save you time. Mm-hmm. We save you money because we're saving time. We also are your political cover and we and we can control usually the board and your your and we also are the 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 leadership we we offer leadership and confidence to your donors and to your volunteer leaders. Mm-hmm. So that's a short list of what consultants do that um, we, we, we add the credibility um, to a campaign. We, I've, I've seen some donors that want to make sure there is a professional consulting firm behind the campaign because they want to make sure it's well run. Have you run into that, Catherine? Yes, I've, I have run into that. And in fact, we see it in several of our clients where in some cases it has been a board member or a, le- or a volunteer leader who has really strongly recommended that the organization hire a consultant like us. Uh, to help them. And by the way, our, our we are a smaller boutique consulting company. We do not work off of templates. Um, mm-hmm. Every everyone who works with us, um, our 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 staff are very very senior leaders. We've been around the block. We enjoy having a smaller company where we can be hands on with our projects. Um, so that's just a differentiating factor from us from the very very large well known um, companies that are. Um, um, sometimes the first go-to. We, we, we're, we're the second go-to when that one doesn't work out right. <laughs> Gail, when, if we have time when we finish six, I'd like to answer Stacy's question about coming up short in the campaign. And I think it will answer a lot of people's questions that were in this. Let, let's do the image. This is our last of the six points, okay? And so the image is pretty straightforward. There is an issue of timing 
for every campaign. We, there is an issue of reputation and track record. And if your organization is in the public eye and you are perceived as a leader and there is confidence in the leadership of running your organization and in your board, this sets the, excuse me, sets the stage for excellent fundraising. Right, Catherine? It absolutely does. I mean, it's huge. Your reputation of your organization and image of your organization and the image of the work. This is really getting to the impact of your organization on the community it serves. And I say it that way because it could be a local community-based organization and it could be a large national organization. The community is more um, geographically dispersed. But whatever community you're serving, you need to be showing that impact. This is what um, this is what really does make a make a difference in the campaign and in your success going forward. So your reputation of gaining getting results and and impacting whatever issue you're addressing in your community is critical. Mm-hmm. Tim wants to know if we walk into a campaign and bring a rolodex of donors, and I would say generally not, <laughs> because we have to work with your donors your culture, your community. And um, I would say that you probably are going to be hard, hard pressed to find consultants who are going to walk in and offer you a list of donors because those donors may or may not be interested in and have a track record in your organization. Remember, the reason we start with your organization's donors is the rule of the concentric circles. It takes much less time to close a major gift from someone who is already invested in you, knows you, knows the leadership, and is passionate about your work. If you're looking at donor A or B way over there or on the other side of the world, yes, they there's a we can bring we can bring that name to you, but developing a relationship with that donor from scratch, right. closing a major gift with that donor is a much longer and more expensive endeavor. Do you have any thoughts, Catherine? Agreed. I think you know, we, like Gail was saying about there are lots of ways to find. Um, Well, let me put it this way. Likely major donors are lurking in your database and you don't know that they are there until, you know, we do a a well screen, especially if you do not have a major gift program. If you don't have a major gift program, never really talk to donors. Donors just don't walk in and mail in a major gift either. Um, (laughs) Like that gentleman's story we told who'd been giving regularly to the Habitat affiliate had never made a gift larger than, than $75. And then he comes in the campaign um, and he makes a $125,000 commitment. He and his wife did. So, um, so it's really important and it takes, it takes you, it takes time. And I would say this too, when we do, do, um, like Gail said, we work with donor search and generally on average, this is kind of on average and it varies by organization people, you would have around 20% of major gift potential in your database. Yeah. Well, I, you might I mean, you might be sitting there going, well, that didn't sound like a lot, but I have yet to see a client make it all the way through that 20%. Mm-hmm. <laughs> By the way, I've got the screen up. We're sending this to you as your free gift. It's our, um, our capital campaign readiness checklist. And if you'd like, you can go back into our website and, and you can get a detailed article that I personally wrote. Um, on all six of these areas. And so mm-hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to this one and let's do some Q&A. We've got so many wonderful questions. And I want to tell you, we got over 50 questions in advance of this webinar. So we may have another webinar that's just Q&A for some fun. So we'll let you know if we do that. But let's tackle the question that you wanted to address. Yeah, Kat. so this is Stacy's question. She's at the end of a campaign. Let me find it again. Here we go. And um, you have donors, you have a nice list of donors. Oh, you've inherited this. Okay. Oh, oh, opportunity abounds. Um, and a list of campaign donors who gave um, gave to the campaign the last three years, and they're eight hundred thousand dollars short. Um, and she's wondering what to do with this. And so here's what I think you should do, if, based on that, because you 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 need first number one, you need to take that list of donors and you need to evaluate them, like we talked about in this webinar. So you want to put their kind of range to what kind of level do you think their giving would be? Don't overstate it. Don't understate it as best you can. That's why a range is nice. And is that eight hundred thousand in that av- available within that group of people? Based on who you think is closest to your to your organization, go have a meeting with them, and this is what you want to do. You want to talk about the impact of that eight hundred thousand. Yep. 
you're here without the, you know, you haven't made it. Here's where you are. What, what will not happen because you haven't reached the goal and the impact of what's going to happen. And you see if you can get a few of those donors to commit to that level to kind of bring that down. And then you can go back to the rest of them to see if they can get you over that uh, finish line, the impact of that success and what that means. So what that $800,000 means, and then you really celebrate, celebrate it greatly. I think you can get there as long as those donors you have on that list can um, their potential giving can add up to 800,000. And I have another strategy. You're new and you can, oh, that, that's the largest, largest do- you take advantage of being new. You're just mm-hmm. like a blank slate. Oh, Mr. Donor, please give me your impressions of our campaign. Tell me how you came to be a donor and why you believe in us so much. So, um, so you, so that's how you get in the door and then you ask them for advice. Do you have, and these are, these are, these are strategies we teach every day mm-hmm. is the advice visit. You may have heard about it, of course. Um, but uh, you ask them, um, tell me we're $800,000 short. What are their impressions of how, how we should be able to complete the campaign? And then it's easy to say, is this something you might like to help with? Mm-hmm. Very easy, very organic. And it's not the slightest bit pushy. So everybody, um, gosh, thank you so much. This is so much fun. Cara, I want to have a shout out for you. My daughter said, texted me in the middle of the webinar and said to be sure to say hello. My daughter works for Free Will, by the way. Um, and um, also, uh, I, want to, I want to take another question real briefly about phases of a campaign, because a lot of the early questions mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. all shared with us, people were asking, how long should the silent phase be? When do we announce the campaign? Um, can you give us approximate months and timing for each stage of the campaign? Uh, we, we have a very specific methodology about this. And the general rule of thumb is do not announce your campaign to the public until you know where the rest of the money will come in. You need your prospect list identified and qualified and you know you're working on these gifts and you know these gifts should complete your campaign or hopefully be more than your campaign total, that's when you announce. Don't don't just announce because you've got pressure to announce, but instead line up all those dominoes so they're ready to close. Right, Catherine? Right. And one of the things we also see is that, um, you know, keep in mind the quiet phase, public phase thing was invented about 1970 something. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Talk about which century we're talking about. But um, so keep in mind, you when you really focus in on your lead donors, your major donors for your campaign, you don't need as many donors to be successful with your campaign. So, for example, that the uh, client we would have mentioned several times with the ten million dollar gift that they have raised that ten million dollars with, I believe, 50 donors, mm-hmm. 50 donors. And so they're they're not quite halfway through their campaign. They will be soon. And so we'll probably have another f- somewhere 50 to 70 more donors, maybe a little more, maybe a hundred. Um, but that's, you know, it's not, a, it's, you're not necessarily casting this widely. This also helps protect against um, kind of cannibalizing into your annual giving and your other ongoing support. This also positions the campaigns that actually has positive impacts on your other fundraising. Mm-hmm. So well, again, the- very strategic approach. One time somebody reached out to us and said um, that they were hoping to raise the final 20% of their campaign from a, a mail, a mail drop and mm. nothing's crickets. <laughs> so we said, gosh, that's, that's not a strategy. We would have, mm-hmm. we would have. Mm-hmm. So everybody, we need to close out. All it's, right. Thank you all. It's time and it's raining here in North Carolina. We've got a huge weather system that just moved in. Um, mm-hmm. Thank you so much. I hope this was helpful to you. We we love helping our nonprofit friends. If you are planning a campaign, want to talk to us, we'd love to have a strategy call and see if we're a fit as a potential consulting firm. And um, we wish you all the fundraising success, all the major gift fundraising success, and all the capital campaign. We made your capital campaigns be wildly successful. Absolutely. So thank you all for being here and thank you all for the nice um, comments in the in the chat box. And um, we look forward to I I really look forward to Gail tackling some of these additional questions in an additional webinar in the future. It'd be great fun. And if you're still with we've got 48 people still with us. What were your impressions? What were your takeaways? We usually ask for takeaways. I forgot to do that. What were your takeaways today? If anybody wants to share our remaining 43 people. 
um, insight. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly and Christine. Appreciate that. Anybody, what were your takeaways that, that, that is going to be helpful for your next campaign? Oh, people are running off. They've got other things to do. Get aligned. Plan, plan, plan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brittany Blue. Um, so we wish you so much success, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Bye. Bye.